Lehigh University. And today I'm going to be talking about how we're using data-driven modeling as well as Monte Carlo simulations to explore some correlations for the absorption entropy for various molecules within various silicious zeolites. And so the motivation behind this project stems from the fact that it's difficult to quantify the entropy. When it comes to experiments, there are values that typically span across several papers. And when it comes to simulating them, ab initio techniques will take a lot of time. We could do ab initio AIFD, we can correct the harmonic oscillator by doing quantum and harmonic corrections, but these are computationally expensive. Additionally, we can use classical uh, force field based models. Unfortunately, these are not always accurate, and sometimes the force field isn't available for the system we want to use it for. Now, probably the most ubiquitous in terms of electrokinetic modeling is to simply use correlations. So, we typically calculate the harmonic oscillator, the vibrational entropy, and we add a correction term if the molecule can be assumed to have some degree of translational freedom. Or, we can use correlations that are just fit to experimental data. And so the scope of today's presentation is to use United Atom force field based methods to not be able to quantify with experimental accuracy the absorption entropy, but to qualitatively investigate correlations that have been exhibited and actually shown experimentally to exist. So, looking at correlations in the absorption entropy goes back a few years with some notable papers. Uh, for example, here, Campbell and Sellers looked at the, or they compiled a series of experimentally determined absorption entropies for alkanes and alcohols on two-dimensional catalytic surfaces. And what they found is that when they plotted these entropy values on the y-axis against each molecule's respective gas phase entropy on the x-axis, is they got this very nice linear correlation. And so they performed a linear least squares regression. And apart from the predictive capability that it could be used for, the authors also suggested that there's some underlying physics going on that, that this equation can explain. In particular, the slope of 0.7, that's approximately two-thirds. And so the authors suggested that this two-thirds represents the degrees of freedom allotted to the molecule when it absorbs on the catalytic surface. So to demonstrate this, we have some sort of uh, catalytic surface with an ethylene molecule absorbing. And now it went from having three degrees of translational freedom in that gas phase to only having two, namely those of translation of the two dimensions along the surface and two degrees of rotations uh, to the surface as well. And so this idea was later expanded to zeolites by Paul Donhauer and Omar Abdurrahman. So um, here they have taken a series of experimentally determined absorption entropies for various alkanes and a few alkenes within acidic zeolites. And what they discovered is that when they plotted the absorbing entropy on the y-axis against each molecule's respective gas phase entropy, just like in the Campbell and Sellers paper, is that these linear correlations continue to persist. But the slope was no longer just two-thirds, as in the case of a two-dimensional catalytic surface, but it now depended on the size of the zeolite. Namely, if we look at phagocyte, which is larger in terms of pore and occupiable volume than MFI, it has a larger slope, meaning that the molecule retains more degrees of freedom. It has a larger entropy within the voids of phagocyte as opposed to MFI. And so here's an animation to illustrate this, where we have an ethene molecule absorbing within a unicell of MFI, and it can now translate to an area or volume commensurate to the size of the pore. Likewise, depending on where it absorbs or how large the molecule is, it'll retain some degrees of rotational freedom, or perhaps it was all of them. And so this is where our work comes in. We first ask the question, can we reproduce these trends by performing molecular simulations? Uh, additionally, how far do these trends hold? When do they break down and for what reason? And so our approach was to perform Monte Carlo simulations to quantify the absorption entropy uh, for 37 different molecules across five variously sized zeolites. And so our force fields came from the TRAPI database, uh, from the Seekman group, and we performed our Monte Carlo simulations using uh, NIST, our collaborators at NIST developed a uh, uh, simulation package known as FEAST. 
Now, I want to take a brief moment to explain how exactly we perform these calculations. So, over on the left-hand side, we have the traditional route of experimentally determining uh, the absorption entropy, where we generate an isotherm at several temperatures. And within the Henry's region, we can layerize the plot and obtain uh, the delta S value. So we typically assume that it's a Langmuir type absorption, that the number of sites remains the same, they're not interacting. Now, on the right hand side was our method, where in order to save on computational expenses, we took a reference state of infinite dilution. So there are a lot of similarities. But essentially, our, our um, simulation boiled down to taking the Monte Carlo average of the Boltzmann factor. So essentially, in the red here, all we have to do is calculate this Henry's constant at infinite dilution. So instead of generating an entire absorption isotherm, we generate a single point, the point at infinite dilution. And here are some results from these simulations. And what we found is that we were able to reproduce these trends. Now, we may have not reached chemical accuracy, but what we have reached is a qualitative trend. Namely, we, just like in the other two papers, plotted these uh, data points where the y-axis is the uh, absolute um, entropy of the absorbing, and on the x-axis, we have its respective gas phase entropy. And so we performed linear least squares regressions with the slopes represented by eta. And as you can see, as we move down from phalogistite all the way to MFI and ferriorite, these slopes decrease, just like in the experimental papers uh, by Paul Don Howard and Omar al -Baram. Now, another way to represent this data is to plot these slopes against two different size metrics of the zeolite. Namely, on the x-axis in the red, we plot these eta values against the occupiable volume of the zeolite. On the uh, other x-axis, that's shown in green, we plot it against the particle limiting diameter, which is the largest sphere that can fit within uh, the zeolite. And, you see, and as you can see, these slopes decrease. In fact, there's this precipitous drop as we reach Mordenite, where entropic loss becomes very significant. So, the, uh, we now move forward to an expanded data set where we took all the force fields we could get our hands on from the Chappie database, which constituted 80 molecules, and we looked at 68 orthorhombic zeolites. And so upon convergence, we were able to obtain about 4,192 data points. And so here is a histogram of our uh, entropic losses. So uh, on the x-axis, we have all the delta S values. On the y, we have uh, the amount of systems that exhibited those values. And our mean entropy was about 8.5 R, with R being the universal gas constant. Now, the largest entropic loss we found was for a, uh, a, a zeolite known as AWO, which can be thought of as mordenite with the one-dimensional channels, but it has a smaller uh, pore size. Uh, specifically, its diameter was about 1.5 angstrom smaller in mordenite. And the molecule that was able to fit in there was ethyl acrylate. Now, I do want to take a second and mention that we do, in fact, have larger molecules, but they were just unable to converge within these zeolites. Now, our smallest entropic loss was, ironically, our smallest molecule within the largest zeolite in our entire data set. And that was IBW, which has a, a cage size of almost a nanometer. And so here I want to answer the question, where did these linear trends break down? So what we did was we performed linear least squares regression for all of our 4,000 plus data points. So that constituted 69 different zeolites. And what we found is that these trends break down under very large entropic uh, losses. So specifically, when the size of the zeolite shrinks, these linear trends can no longer be used because there are squared values for so poor. So on the y-axis, I have our squared values of these linear fits with uh, more than I just showed as a reference. But how do we now encapsulate all this nonlinearity? And so our approach was to use machine learning. Uh, specifically, we built an artificial neural network to capture this nonlinearity, and then we performed a sensitivity analysis to understand which descriptors were most significant. And so our artificial neural network uh, consisted of an input that included molecular descriptors, shown here in blue, as well as uh, framework descriptors, shown here in red. Now, our molecular descriptors were taken from our DKIT, 
And our framework descriptors were calculated from zero plus plus. And so our output was just a single uh, value, and that was the uh, entropy, the delta S, uh, that we uh, calculated from our Monte Carlo simulations. However, these descriptors are highly correlated, as you can see in the heat map on the right-hand side. And this can really influence our model, especially when we're trying to determine which descriptors are most sensitive. I also have the list of descriptors we chose, and these were based on geometric factors. Uh, and so to limit the amount of correlation, but at the same time salvage as much predictability as we can, we performed a hierarchical clustering where we eliminated approximately half of our descriptors. So we essentially just took the dot product between these descriptors, and those that fell below 45 degrees, or uh, yeah, below 45 degrees, and also constituted a separate unit type were chosen to be part of our model. Likewise, we performed the same type of analysis for our zeolite descriptors. Here are the types of descriptors that were calculated from zero plus plus, and, and as you can see, some of these are highly correlated, they're also inversely correlated. Uh, and so, to limit the number of descriptors, we again perform hierarchical clustering. Uh, and so, uh, here, all the ones that are crossed off were obviously not used within uh, the artificial neural network. Uh, and those that remained are highlighted by the different colors. And these different colors represent different unit types. So here we have our optimized artificial neural network. And we were able to predict the entropy with a mean absolute error of about 0.72 of the universal gas constant. And so we use a very simple neural network it only consists of three hidden layers uh, that contain 80, 50, and 90 neurons, respectively. Uh, the activation function was a rectilinear unit. And what we found is that the model actually struggled a bit in predicting the systems that exhibited higher tropic loss. If you remember the histogram earlier in my presentation, most of our entropic values fell between well, 4 and 8. But as you can see, as we move towards higher and higher entropic losses, the model has a hard time of predicting uh, those values. And so now uh, we decided to look at which descriptors were most important in predicting the model. We wanted to understand how is the artificial neural network choosing, um, or why is the neural network uh, choosing particular descriptors, and how are they used in predicting the entropy? And so, the method we use to do this uh, is called a Sobel sensitivity map analysis, also known as a variance-based sensitivity analysis. And so the theory behind this is that you can actually take any multivariable continuous function and separate it into a sum of orthogonal functions that uh, contain individual contributions. So here, in the red, I have all of my zeolite descriptors, and the blue uh, represent the um, uh, the molecular descriptors. And so we can then calculate the variance for each of these functions, and then the sensitivity is simply the ratio of that individual uh, descriptor over the total variance uh, of the function itself. And so here is just a representation of uh, one of our data points. So this is just an illustration of ethane absorbed within one of the MFI channels, in particular the sine channel. And what we discovered for this system is that the accessible surface area was the most significant descriptor. Now, in terms of the molecular descriptors, the most significant one was the moment of inertia. And so, we did this then for all of our 4,000 plus uh, zeolite systems. And so here, we have the mean of all of the systems, of all the system sensitivities. And we, um, uh, we found some, in, uh, some very interesting results. In particular, the framework descriptors are more important than the molecular descriptors. And this was shown back in the paper by Paul Donhauer and Omar Abdurrahman. Uh, specifically, they found a universal uh, descriptor known as the occupiable volume of the zeolite to predict the entropy across several alkenes. And what we found is that the most important descriptor, at least for our systems, was actually the accessible surface area. And it, what it did was it, so the model actually found both accessible surface areas that normalized by the unit cell volume, but also that normalized by the unit cell mass as being the most significant. Uh, so the unit cell volume was also found to be sensitive, but we hypothesized that, that this is due because we uh, normalized almost all of these descriptors by the unit cell volume. 
Additionally, the next important framework descriptor was the largest spherical diameter, all the way on the right hand side. Now, in terms of the frame, in terms of the molecular descriptors, what we found was that actually the principal moment of inertia was the most significant molecular descriptor. And so we hypothesized that this may go back to the limitations in the rotational freedom of the molecule of um, its work within the zeolite. Uh, however, although this, these are our mean values, they vary quite a bit uh, among all of our different systems, as you can see here. So the red bars represent the maximum and the min minimum values of these sensitivities. And so I want to just show you a few important cases. Uh, namely, what we found in terms of the most important, uh, or the systems that had the moment of inertia listed as our most important or most sensitive parameter, included, for the most part, ethyl acrylate. Now, if you remember, ethyl acrylate was actually uh, the, the molecule that had the, had the largest entropic loss. Additionally, we found that ethane was also one of the, the uh, systems that had the, that had the principal moment of inertia as one of the most sensitive parameters. Now, the, uh, now the systems that had the least significant sensitivities towards the uh, principal moment of inertia was, again, methane within the very large IV, IWV zeolite framework. Uh, additionally, you see this framework pop up again and again within the systems where the principal moment of inertia really was not that significant uh, to begin with. Now, uh, the next steps we're deciding to take is to now create interpretable models based off of these results. So we have the sensitivities and we know which descriptors are important. And one uh, quintessential engineering way to approach this is to perform a Buckingham Pi analysis, where we take our descriptors and we can then form independent uh, dimensionless quantities. So over here in the red, I have all of our framework descriptors, and in the blue, we have our molecular descriptors. And we can, cons and we can separate their uh, fundamental units in terms of length and mass. And we can systematically generate dimensionless quantities. And so we can either then use these to build a, another neural network, and now all of these will be independent, or we can then use these to further create more interpretable models, such as using analytical regression or some other uh, type of models. Uh, so with that, I would like to conclude and thank the audience, in particular my advisors, my fellow lab mates, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you.